Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Pranav and uh, I'm a senior consultant at Startup Genome's ecosystem advisory practice. I'm here to talk to you today about deep technology startup ecosystems, what they are, why they're important, and how we can build one together. Maybe just to start with, I want to talk a little bit about startup ecosystems and how far they've come in our world today. When we look at startup ecosystems, they're disrupting industry after industry. We saw that in, from 2019 to 2021, the annual growth rate of startup ecosystems was 35%, which is about three to four times faster than any of our individual national economies. And technology today constitutes of about 6% of all of our total global economy, and that excludes life sciences, which is about another 10%. So we know that startup ecosystems are incredibly important, and we see that within the next 20 years, we predict that startup ecosystems will be the single largest sector of the global economy. So again, incredibly important, so very important to understand how we can build one together. However, we see that startup ecosystems are not democratized in where they create value. So the Silicon Valleys, London's, Beijing's, New York's of the world continue to create the maximum share of value that we see from startup ecosystems. And Startup Genome's mission is really to flatten this curve, to break this concentration so that all economies, all ecosystems of all shapes and sizes can contribute their fair share of value into this new economy. So why are we talking about this today? Well, specifically in the spirit of sciencepreneurship, we see that deep tech or business models that are based on scientific innovation have really captured startup ecosystems. They are the primary cause or primary driver of growth that we see in tech startup ecosystems today. In 2020, we saw that 30% of all deals that took place in the startup ecosystem were in deep tech startups. So we see that they're incredibly important and they're really creating all of the value that we see. When we zoom in a little bit more, we see that on, you, on the x-axis you have here exits, and on the y-axis you have series A growth, we see that across all of the ends, it's deep tech sectors that are causing this growth, right? So on the y-axis where you have series A growth, which is a leading indicator to value creation, you see really core scientific subsectors that are performing much better than others. So that's ag tech, that's um, advanced manufacturing and robotics, clean tech, all of the things that we really need for world impact are really growing in terms of their funding. And on the x-axis where you see exits, the realization of value, we see some deep tech there too. AI and BD, which is artificial intelligence and big data, as well as blockchain are really leading the way in terms of sectoral growth in the startup ecosystem. Ecosystems or geographies that specialize specifically in specific subsectors tend to punch above their weight. We already know that deep technology sectors are growing really, really fast. Those ecosystems or jurisdictions that specialize in specific sectors tend to grow much faster and punch above their weight. I'll take the example of New Zealand here. In New Zealand, you see that in our global startup ecosystem ranking of 350 ecosystems, they rank at about 77, so not that much. But if you look at their subsector ranking in ag tech, that ranks at 25. So they punch far above their weight because they choose to specialize. They use all of the assets that they have and specialize in creating more and more success in agricultural technologies. Now, how do they do that? Deep tech innovation ecosystems are a little bit different from traditional startup ecosystems, right? So we have at the confluence, of, the confluence of the traditional innovation ecosystem and the startup ecosystem is really where deep tech innovation takes place. So that includes corporations that invest in deep technologies, universities that provide talent, and patents. All of these things in the traditional innovation ecosystem foster the growth of deep technology in, uh, entrepreneurship by interacting with the startup ecosystem. So funding, entrepreneurial mindsets, the confluence of these two form successful deep tech innovation ecosystems or deep tech startup ecosystems. At Startup Genome, we call this ambidexterity. The ability to do both is where deep tech innovation ecosystems thrive. Now, a lot of specialization decisions are, of course, based on what assets you have in the traditional innovation ecosystem, and that, of course, makes sense. But at the same time, the ramp that's built between these two is really what drives performance. I'd like to take maybe one quick example. Here you have Seoul. Um, in this chart here, maybe I'll take a second to explain this chart. This is basically a regression line between 
the traditional innovation ecosystem and the startup ecosystem. So the regression line basically represents what is typical performance between these two variables. And you see Seoul, which is so high in the traditional innovation ecosystem in terms of its performance, performing a little bit lower in terms of startup ecosystem performing, performance, telling us that there's a little bit more potential for something like a Seoul to be able to leverage its manufacturing assets, to leverage its deep technologies, to be able to create more impact in the startup ecosystem. When you look at San Diego, though, you see that although they don't have necessarily the most traditional innovation ecosystem assets, they punch far above their weight, number three in the world in terms of their startup ecosystem performance. This really shows that those ramps between these two segments are very strong and allow for more spin-off creation and allow for more startup performance. I think the question for all of us today is how can we build these ramps together? What can we do so that our traditional innovation ecosystems talk to our startup ecosystems? They're not done alone, and it requires a little bit of community building and collaboration between these two ecosystems. Serendipity is not an accident. It is often built through deliberate policy. Can we create collaborative spaces so that these two ecosystems talk to each other? Can we build functions so that there is more co-founder matching, so that there is more conversations that are happening between these two ecosystems, both the startup ecosystem and the traditional innovation ecosystem, as well as finding funding, for example, that allows for not just software-based funding, which we typically see in our startup ecosystems, but more patient capital that allows for the growth of deep tech startup ecosystems. All of these things are key for us to think about as we're looking at this new era of deep tech innovation ecosystems and trying to solve the world's biggest problems. Thank you. Wow. And to think I was just asking Andreas, do I have to pull him off the stage? Where's my, my hooked stick? Well done. That was really great. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to sort of navigate these, these blinding lights here. I'm going to come a bit closer here. We have, I think, an arm went up. Did you want to ask a question? Oh, please, ask a question. <laughs> what, um, look, I just, um, Prana, thank you very much for that. Um, I just want to gather my thoughts. I'm going to ask one question, then I'm going to bully the rest of you into asking questions. Um, and actually, it was this. You talked about democratization right at the start and how there's a focus in certain locations. And I noticed also in the last two graphs that you had there, you had very actually rich locations. And one of the things that always crops up is what about the rest of the world? Because this is like a two, three, five percent of the world, isn't it? What yeah. we're really talking about. Yeah. Building up ramps. Is there a necessity? Is there a hunger? Is there desire in Nigeria? Um, South Africa would probably be a bit ahead of other places, uh, I don't know, Kenya maybe, but Southeast Asia, other parts, you know, that are not like the usual suspects. What do you say to that? I think um, in general, we see that startups are touching everybody's lives no matter where they are. Uh, but like I mentioned, and, and, and you also showed you in the graph, that the value is still concentrated and that we're not necessarily the best at producing startups domestically if you're not from those top 10, maybe 20 locations. So. This is, of course, incredibly important, and I'm really happy to say that most of the governments that we work with at Startup Genome have prioritized this in terms of putting in pl place the right policy frameworks, putting in place the right strategy to be able to create more startups. It's easier said than done, right? When you're smaller, of course, it's harder to create more. I think that's very much the essence of your question. But at the same time, the question to think about is, what are the assets that already exist in your ecosystem that you can leverage? So for example, Frankfurt, again, maybe not the smallest, but not necessarily the most developed startup ecosystem, tends to punch far above its weight in, let's say, fintech. Yeah, That's because it has a lot of assets within the financial technology space that it's able to leverage. And a lot of other ecosystems across the world has these assets that I think are just waiting to be activated into the startup ecosystem. So definitely more to be done. But, and I will say that for these smaller locations, these non-top 20, non-top 50, there's still potential by activating whatever resources they have in their ecosystems. I have a follow-up question, but I'm not going to ask it. There's a hand over there. Excellent. Are you looking at growth? Let's just wait for the microphone. Okay, sorry. Are you That's looking at growth of the ecosystems? Because um, maybe in the top five, top 10, you might see, I don't know, doubling in whatever time period it is, while some of the other, let's say, second tier, third tier, you might see much bigger growth, or which are maybe rising stars that we don't see yet on these maps? Yeah, really good question. So I, for more reference, of course, I'd love to share with you the Startup Genome Emerging Rankings list, which talks a little bit about these 
tier two or challenger economies. So we've seen, for example, Jakarta, Detroit, all of these ecosystems tend to punch far above their weight in terms of how big they are, but in terms of how much value they create, right? Con contrasting kind of both of them. These are what we call emerging ecosystems. And what we see these doing, what we see these ecosystems doing really well is kind of what I mentioned, right? Looking at how we can activate local resources. So it doesn't have to be necessarily corporations or even some of the innovation assets that I talked about, but even, for example, activating universities so that there's a little bit more connection between the startup ecosystem and the traditional innovation ecosystem. Yeah, so those are some of the faster growing ones that we see. And we, I, I think in terms of growth in general, we're, we're looking at an age where a lot more are punching far above their weight um, based on some of their specializations. Any other questions? We have one up the far. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to discriminate against you. Go for you. So um, I think there's a really a trend that next. entrepreneurs would uh, move to these big centers of startups. So how do you think we could make these other uh, smaller hubs also attractive for aspiring founders or founders? It's a really good question. So when we look at ecosystem evolution, and we've been doing this study for the last 10 years or so, what we've seen is that in the early stages of ecosystem development, there's a lot more resource leakage than resource attraction, right? Basically what you said, uh, we see a lot of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs leaving for the Silicon Valleys, the Berlins of the world, right? And the number one thing that we see that keeps entrepreneurs together in these more activation phase ecosystems is community. Right. So when there's a stronger community of entrepreneurs, stronger support, we see that they're more tied to the ecosystem they're already in. And they get the feeling that, yes, we can. It's not a Silicon Valley necessarily, but we can make it here. We have the support mechanism. We have the support systems for us to be able to succeed. And it takes a village, right? Or maybe it takes a valley, I guess I like to say, in, uh, in ecosystem parlance. But at the same time, that means that you need accelerators, incubators, the right policies, uh, peers that are willing to help you out, and a culture that fosters these kind of connections. I think that would be the single most important thing in preventing leakage and then, of course, driving growth. Thank you. We've got one final question at the front here. So was I right in understanding that you don't have an independent gauge of the deep tech entrepreneurship ecosystem? You just have traditional and startup? Because it strikes me that having university labs and tech VC funds is not sufficient to have a deep tech ecosystem because you need labs for deep tech companies and funds for deep tech companies. So we look at measuring startup ecosystems as a whole, which includes which of which deep tech ecosystems are a subset in a sense, right? Because they're a subset of the overall startup ecosystem. But at the same time, I, I completely agree with you that deep tech ecosystems kind of need different ingredients to be built, right? So when we look at deep tech ecosystems, we like to look at them as the confluence of the traditional innovation ecosystem and startup ecosystems, right? Because they leverage all the things you said. They leverage universities, they leverage corporations, they leverage R&D and patents in a way that shallow tech ecosystems don't necessarily do, right? So when we rank specific um, deep tech ecosystems, and you kind of saw some with Seoul, you saw some with San Diego, we look at things like patents, we look at things like university rankings, right? And we also try to understand um, corporations that are within those deep tech segments. So for deep tech segments specifically, we try to look at the confluence of these two things. And when I say confluence, within the startup ecosystem, that includes also deep tech VCs, right? So patient capital, because that's the most important thing when it comes to funding for deep tech startups in a way that it's not as important for shallow tech ecosystems, right? So when we're, when we're looking at these, deep tech takes a little bit of a different lens because we look at both of these together. Thank you very much, um, Pranav Arya of Startup Genome. Thank you very much for your time and coming. <laughs>